In the world of video games, faith is a concept rarely explored with any amount of nuance. When religion is encountered in games, it is usually a narrative device for the player to encounter fanaticism. In horror games like Silent Hill and Outlast, cultists pursue and menace the player characters, talking in vague apocalyptic epithets. In more action-focused games like Far Cry 5 and Halo 2, and the Halo series as a whole, religious zealots pursue grand crusades against the player, echoing real-life religious extremism in not-so-subtle ways. Aside from the scattered indie games and RPG side quests like those found in several Fallout games, religions in video games are usually little more than cults, their respective beliefs serving as foolproof excuses for the player's wrath. There's usually no deeper exploration to their faith, why they follow their religion, or more tangible aspects of real-life faith, like a sense of unity and understanding many find in insular religious communities. Most games aren't interested in such things, I suspect partially because it might make antagonists too sympathetic, but also because religion is so easily understood as a pathway to irredeemable disagreement that can only be solved through violence, which in most AAA games is the primary currency of gameplay. It's also worth noting here that in the context games usually approach religion in, that religion and faith might as well be separate things. These characters, often being villains, seldom suffer crises of faith or waver in the convictions that lead them into conflict with the player. There are exceptions to the rule, one of the best being the Arbiter story told in Halo 2 and 3, where the Arbiter, an assassin for the religious zealot alien cabal the Covenant, uncovers a conspiracy that reveals the Covenant leadership to be willingly deceiving the other alien species in the clan. The end result is Arbiter and his species the elites turning their backs on the Covenant and joining the humans in their struggle. But even in this example, the Arbiter's faith itself is rarely in question. So much of his crisis is based in the tangible rather than the abstract. He uncovers the threads of deceit, is informed that he and his kind are being lied to, and while he initially denies the truth, is easily swayed for convenience of plot flow and player attention span. His faith is a malleable asset in Halo's world, one that is easily wavered with evidence to the contrary of his beliefs. In the real world, faith is much less unstable. Faith itself is a hard thing to quantify, as it can apply to belief outside of religion. Plenty of people who aren't religious have faith, it's a very broad term. You can have faith that a car won't break down, or have faith that a friend will come through and help you move with their truck. You can have faith in a politician, a company, an ideal, or any number of things. Sometimes it's based on the tangible, in that which is easily proven or disproven. But much of what makes faith unique is that it can also be highly irrational based on what we desperately want to believe to be true, but have no real proof of. For the purposes of my argument in this essay, I would go with the broad, religiously tinged definition found in Merriam-Webster that faith is a, quote, firm belief in something for which there is no proof. It's hard to examine something so nebulous in the form of a video game. The myriad ways in which faith can manifest, combined with the fanatical nature so many games approach faith with, would seemingly make games a poor medium to explore questions of belief. Yet there's one game in series that stand as some of the best meditations on faith and belief I can think of, regardless of medium. On the surface, Machine Games' Wolfenstein games, in particular the first game in their rebooted series, 2014's The New Order, are run-of-the-mill first-person shooters. They feature shiny, id-tech-powered graphics, multiple approaches to gameplay for replayability, impactful gunplay, and a cinematic and often over-the-top story full of likable characters and dastardly villains. But in between the lines, the New Order cements a legacy as a modern shooter classic that's more than the sum of its parts. The game's systems, in keeping with its legacy as a progenitor of the first-person shooter genre, are at times obtuse. It eschews recharging health and linear level design in favor of health packs that need to be picked up and often labyrinthine environments that hide alternative routes and secrets. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay ties into the themes of the narrative as players scrounge resources, sneak around, and face off against overwhelming enemy forces. This cohesion serves as a basis for a character-oriented story where all seems lost, save for the ability of the main character, and by extension the player. And in the middle of these disparate elements, Wolfenstein manages to deliver a thesis on the power of belief in the face of hopelessness, and faith when all hope seems lost.
The concept of Machine Games Wolfenstein series is simple, though harrowing. The New Order kicks off in 1960, where American Special Forces soldier B.J. Blaskowitz has awakened from nearly a decade in a vegetative state to find the Allies lost World War II and the Nazis have taken over the planet. In The New Order, B.J. works to rebuild the Resistance, striking from the heart of Berlin. In the game's sequel, The New Colossus, B.J. has been crippled and must kickstart and unite fledgling American Resistance cells to take back America, racing against time as his own body fails him. While the story across both games is excellent, the thematic foundation of the New Order and its sequels is gameplay, and it's a concrete foundation. Without it, the narrative wouldn't hit nearly as hard as it does. If you removed all the cutscenes, the endearing characters, and memorable moments, the player-controlled action would still depict a heroic and often helpless feeling struggle against nearly impossible odds. And the reason behind that helpless feeling is Nazis. In the pantheon of video game enemies, Nazis are pretty near the top. They're easy to hate, bigots that are universally understood to be evil. Add to that, they are often depicted as smug, perfectionist sociopaths, which only make them easier to dislike. The Wolfenstein games, however, flesh out their antagonists more than most Nazi killing games. The New Order features General Death's Head as the main antagonist, who is fleshed out with a cruel torture sequence near the beginning of the game. He's composed of every Pulp Fiction Nazi stereotype, a disfigured mad scientist obsessed with perfecting the master race. The other antagonist of New Order, and later in New Colossus, Frau Engel, is similarly obsessed with appearances and physical aptitude, even physically and mentally abusing her own daughter Greta for her perceived faults. Neither of these characters are particularly original in their goals or depictions. They wear the standard cliches of Nazi villainy on their sleeves, examining people as subjects to be studied rather than people with their own agencies and independence. The aforementioned torture scene with General Death's Head is a good example, where he forces BJ to choose which of his partners to kill, poking and prodding with observations about which one has the better eyes. The player's first encounter with Frau Engel features a random game of word association, which is revealed to be a trick for her own amusement. It's initially depicted as a method of weeding out those with, quote, impure blood, but when she gives up the joke, she mentions that she knows BJ is pure because if he wasn't, he would have gone for the gun sitting on the table. Another example showing the callous nature of the Nazis without a specific subject is a scene where BJ must fight his way out of a mental hospital where the Nazis have begun killing everyone indiscriminately, finding no use for the mentally impaired subjects anymore. These instances are extreme, but not unrealistic. The Nazis murdered millions of innocent people, conducted inhumane and medically ridiculous experiments on the mentally ill, often under the guise of perfecting the master race. More than any smugness or violence, Nazis are easy to hate because it's understood that they would prefer to subjugate and dehumanize anyone who is different. And subjugation is exactly how Wolfenstein makes the player feel like less than an equal. It's this subjugation that forms the backbone of the New Order and the New Colossus hopeless tones. When BJ first emerges into Berlin, he sees a concrete horizon, yawning for miles in every direction. The streets are still and quiet, save for the stormtroopers hauling prisoners away to be tortured. By this point, the player knows how evil the Nazis are, what cruelty they're capable of. The previously mentioned scenes with the Sanitarium Massacre and Frau Engel's game are fresh in the player's mind. As BJ sees the terrifying new world he's awoken into, he wonders to himself if there's anything worth saving. Still. Stone. Concrete for miles. I wonder if there's anything in this world worth saving. Desolation. Tyranny. Enemy of endless might. I wonder if I have any friends left standing. It's a valid hypothetical. If you knew the world was full of degrading racist monsters, assured of their own superiority, affixed to their power through only overwhelming force and violence, you'd be tempted to lose hope too. And yet, BJ fights on. I'll talk about BJ's ceaseless hope a bit later, but for now, I want to dig into how the gameplay actually facilitates the game's premise of a world overrun by Nazis, making the player feel hopeless in the process. The gameplay of New Order and New Colossus is centered on a mix of all-out shooting sprees and stealth gameplay. Most arenas allow players to approach the situations how they like, with guns blazing often resulting in the hardest approach as players will be swarmed by enemy reinforcements. On the surface, this trade-off is similar to plenty of other stealth action contemporaries where stealth and planning is rewarded over mindless shooting. But there are plenty of differences that make Wolfenstein stand out, namely that even as a killing machine, 
BJ is pretty powerless compared to his stealth game contemporaries. He doesn't have the gadgets of Batman or Adam Jensen, or the supernatural powers of Corvo and Dishonored. BJ's stealth arsenal is strict, relying on knives and silenced weapons, and unable to easily re-enter stealth once alarms have been sounded. Stealth isn't just part of the gunplay, but the navigation as well. It is literally essential to duck and crouch through sewers, vents, air ducts, and other tight spaces, whether the player chooses to always go loud or lean into the game's stealth mechanics. These kinds of movements and navigating can be found in plenty of other first-person shooters like Call of Duty, certainly, but they're often reserved for tightly scripted stealth sections. In Wolfenstein, it's a recurring gameplay motif, as if to reinforce that, despite BJ's physical strength and ability, his path still requires lowering himself. The very level design enforces lowering the player to something closer to a rodent than the physical muscle-bound FPS hero that BJ is. The penalties for breaking stealth are also heavy. Damage is high, forcing players to duck and weave between cover to avoid it. The game also doesn't feature recharging health like FPS contemporaries Halo or Call of Duty, and features an armor system to help negate damage. With a variety of weapons, grenades, health, and armor to always maintain, another key way Wolfenstein degrades players is to force them to scavenge whatever food, ammo, and armor they can to survive. The food itself is an interesting gameplay point. Taken directly from the 1991 original, However, in the context of that game, it also serves to degrade the player as they scramble to grab random scraps of meat, bread, and vegetables like a starving animal. More seriously, the player can literally eat dog food to regain health. What's meant likely as a comedic callback to the original Wolfenstein, in context of the other ways the New Order tries to lower the player, serves as another piece of dehumanizing, quote, propaganda, for lack of a better term, a way the game willfully subjugates the player. The method of picking up items in the New Order and the New Colossus, where each item picked up requires a button press, has been criticized as unnecessary in a gaming landscape where automatically picking up items when moving over them has become a standard. However, I think, personally, the frantic nature of the action adds to the desperate feel. Between stealth and scavenging, the gameplay cycle forms a solid foundation for how Wolfenstein makes sure the player feels the tension of BJ's situation. I want to be clear that I doubt the game designers set out with the mandate to dehumanize the player in gameplay. The game's thematic state is likely reverse-engineered, starting with abilities for the player to utilize and molding them to what works best to create a challenge while still working within the narrative confines of BJ's journey. It's also worth noting that Wolfenstein's gameplay system, despite BJ's brutish strength and intimidating frame, doesn't value sheer strength as much as playing smart. While it serves to set Wolfenstein apart from other boomer shooter revivals, it's also thematic. One of the core identifying tenets of fascism and fascistic thought is exerting strength over your enemies, conquering through overwhelming might. What message would the game send if BJ's journey was nothing but an all-out shooting gallery that never forced the player to slow down and think? How could a game so plainly denounce an ideology and then use the most basic expression of that same ideology to approach its gameplay? Thankfully, Wolfenstein doesn't. Additionally, there are several points through BJ's journey where he is subjected to dehumanizing treatment. He is tattooed with a barcode upon entering a work camp. He is stabbed multiple times. He is left for dead. In the second game, he is tortured, beaten, and taunted. His disgrace made a point of national attention as a wanted fugitive. The player experiences all of this in first person, given limited control as these situations play out. While they don't have total control, aren't able to make any choices or impact the proceedings in any way, the perspective still gives the impression that these are happening personally to the player. And then there are the Nazis. Through every turn of Wolfenstein, the Nazi forces outnumber and overwhelm BJ. The AI during gameplay isn't static, taking advantage of the game's large environments to flank the player and trap them when possible. The forces are physically imposing, ranging from black armored faceless stormtroopers to soulless machinations. To the player, they are depicted to be a threat even outside of the damage they can do. But there's also something the game gives to the enemy it doesn't give to the player in gameplay. There's still empathy in the way the game presents them to you. You can overhear casual conversations between Nazi guards, often touching on daily life marital problems or other non-racist issues. Enemies cry out in pain, screaming for help when injured and dying. The armored monsters, ranging from cyborg dogs to hulking behemoths, are depicted as tortured experiments, grunting and groaning in pained movements. Even at their most evil, the Nazis are still depicted to the player in subtle ways as human, people that feel things and have lives outside of hunting the player. Their small narrative choices, a byproduct of slick AAA game design and a studio that excels at character-driven stories, but effective in a simple message that carries across both games. The Nazis aren't some unholy evil. 
they're just as human as BJ. A scene with Grace, an American Resistance fighter in the new Colossus, gives a succinct thesis on what the Wolfenstein games think of Nazis. You were here when the bomb hit. Yeah, I was. I survived relatively unscathed because I was on the ground at the time when I came up. Looked like a vision out of Dante's Inferno, you know what I'm saying? I remember the main people just wandering through the smoke. I remember screams that went through the bombed out buildings like howling ghosts. And I remember this mother and son. This boy was blindly stumbling through the chaos. His arms were outstretched, calling out for his mama. And the heat from the bomb had melted the skin on his arms and they just drooped. Like he was wearing a shirt that was a couple of sizes too big. And I remember his mama. She was crawling to get to him. And the half of her body was all gone. It was just gone. What are you thinking in a moment like that? When you know you're losing everything you love. What are you thinking in a moment like that, huh? That's gonna leave a mark. Monsters did this. Not monsters. Men. Combining all of these pieces, the player soon enough settles into a rhythm with Wolfenstein's gameplay. Living under the threat of violence, the player dynamically learns how to avoid conflict. On harder difficulties, the smart player will crawl through vents, sewers, crawl spaces, and more to find their way to their objectives, scrounging for supplies when they can. Otherwise, they are subjected to the wrath of the Reich, with all its vicious automatons and weaponry. In this way, the game constantly forces the player into subjugation, the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay a fitting reflection of the overwhelming odds faced by BJ. Like BJ, the player is meant to feel hopeless, always an inch or a wrong move not just from death, but failure in a grander goal. There's a moment late in the New Order campaign where BJ faces off against a massive robot called the London Monitor. The battle is a fitting metaphor for the New Order's approach to gameplay as a whole. BJ can only gain the upper hand by slinking through a series of sewers and sneaking up on the seemingly unstoppable Iron Behemoth. The Nazis even decry BJ as a vermin for how he fights during the battle. In gameplay, the Wolfenstein games subjugate the player, forcing them to adapt against an overwhelming threat. Stealth, scavenging, and improvising play into the game's themes of being inherently lesser by way of not being one of the master race. This works both as an extension of the enemy's overwhelming might and an expression of how the state dehumanizes rebellion in a totalitarian regime. But in addition, the gameplay works in tandem with the more explicit narrative of the game, told in player interactions and cutscenes. Though interestingly, while the gameplay helps to create a sense of hopelessness for the player, the stories told in The New Order and The New Colossus often focus on the value of hope in the face of overwhelming odds, even when all seems lost. I've just outlined how the gameplay systems in Wolfenstein help to craft a sense of hopelessness through subjugating the player and forcing them to adapt to survive, but the narrative aspects are much more straightforward. They depict a hopeless world filled with desperation and suffering. The world around BJ is one that despises weakness in all forms. Emotional weakness, physical weakness, mental imbalances, it's no surprise given it's a world taken over by eugenicists. But BJ's history with weakness, and being perceived as weak, goes deeper. The old and the weak are doomed. That's what BJ's father says to him at the beginning of the New Colossus, a thesis on the cruel way he sees the world. In life, you got to make hard decisions. And sometimes, you got to punish the animals out there. It's kill or be killed. The old and the weak are doomed. All manners of scum and sickly minds and dirty bodies and cockroaches doing everything in their power to rob the white man of what he's earned. Like everything else his father proudly proclaims, it's not true. 
His father says it's up to the white man to sort out the queer, that the white man needs to fight against the coloreds and unclean masses. These are just as much lies as the old and weak being doomed, but it's something that sticks in BJ's mind throughout the new Colossus. As his aging body fails him after his encounter with Death's Head, he begins to wonder when he will die. He begins to feel the weight of the world moving against him, opposed not just by an entire tyrannical regime, but by time itself. And it's a recurring theme across both New Order and New Colossus. I want to go back to the choice Death's Head gives to BJ at the beginning of the game. It's actually the only choice the player gets that changes the outcome of the narrative in the New Order. Depending on which character the player saves, the game splits into two timelines, with a unique character alive and a unique supporting character in the Resistance base. There's no right answer, and the game acknowledges that. Fast forward to 1960, and either fighter will eventually join the Resistance. But they carry their trauma with them. I'm getting old, Blazkowicz. I don't know how much longer I can keep doing this. We'll be alright, we can still get the job done. Aye? For how much longer? What's this about, Fergus? I don't know. Nothing. Everything. It's about that boy, goddammit, Private Wyatt. He should be here instead of me. He was young. He, he had potential. He could have given us a future. You and me were two fucking mummies from the past, running on nothing but willpower. I made the wrong choice. Well, that's fucking obvious, isn't it? I was ready to die. I would have done it gladly. I worked my ass off to save that boy, Blazkowicz, and you fucking pissed it away on a whim. Remember Prendergast? That fucking kid, he could endure anything. Now he's gone. They're all fucking gone. But you're stuck with this useless fucking skeleton. I mean, tell me, what's the long-term solution, eh? Who's gonna take over when we're too damn battered to strap on the horses anymore? If you save the grizzled veteran Fergus, he regrets being too old and battered to see the war to an end, wishing Private Wyatt was saved. If you save Private Wyatt, he bemoans his own inexperience, a young man thrust into a grown man's war, unprepared for the responsibilities he's delivered. He insists Fergus would have been the right choice. But there is no right choice, that's the point. There's no easy way through Resistance, no special master key that would give BJ the upper hand once and for all. Even at the game's most triumphant, BJ's victories are tinged with tragedy. When he finally kills Death's Head, he himself is left for dead. When his body is recovered at the beginning of the New Colossus, the Resistance is under siege from Frau Engel's forces. Even as he kills Frau Engel and kickstarts a nationwide American Resistance, it doesn't mark a final victory. His daughters are still fighting Nazis nearly 20 years later after the events of the New Colossus. Even if the battles are won, the war lingers on. Then why would someone keep fighting? In one of my favorite scenes in the New Order, BJ visits Set Roth, an inventor and member of a secret Jewish order. The two talk inside a concentration camp, inspired directly by the crimes against humanity perpetrated at sites like Auschwitz and Dachau. Set talks about a woman who had lost her family, whose will to survive had finally been broken. He notes that faith kept her going, but also that he himself cannot be so steadfast. He says, there must always be doubt, otherwise there's no room to question, to learn. I, I, I cannot believe in such certainty. For me and everything, there must be doubt, otherwise there's no room to question, to learn. And, gosh, look at this place, this is the fruit of unquestioned, ferocious conviction. This is where absolute certainty leads. Yet you are a believer. I often wonder what kind of a God would sanction suffering such as this, and I question myself whether my faith is misplaced. Maybe he's testing us. Well, Egyptian, if he is testing us, we are failing gloriously. Set then notes that the concentration camp, and by extension the Nazis' rule, is the end result of unquestioned loyalty. It's true enough from his point of view. Frau Engel herself is a devious embodiment of Nazi teachings. The world she helps create is one of bloodshed and pain, one where brute force is all that matters and there's no place for weakness. It's the kind of absolute bigotry echoed by BJ's own father. The old and the weak are doomed. Set's tone during the scene is masterfully acted, growing more exasperated with each line. There must always be doubt, Set says. But you are a believer, BJ retorts. They're talking about faith in God in this moment, but I like to think of it as a discussion of a larger ideal. 
could be something as simple as a world without Nazis, or as idealistic as a world where nobody has to be subjugated or violated ever again. Set wonders aloud if any god would allow such suffering to persist, to which BJ wonders if God is testing them. Set responds by saying, if he is testing us, we are failing gloriously. It reminds me of a moment in Ellie Wiesel's essential Holocaust autobiography, Night. Published in 1960, Knight is a first-person account of Ellie going through the concentration camps with his father. The book is short but harrowing, a slim read that uses each and every word for maximum evocation. And while I recommend it to anyone, there's a particular passage that sticks out to me. Never shall I forget that night, the first night in camp, that turned my life into one long night seven times sealed. Never shall I forget that smoke. Never shall I forget the small faces of the children whose bodies I saw transformed into smoke under a silent sky. Never shall I forget those flames that consumed my faith forever. Despite its incredibly pulpy and often silly plot points and contrivances, this is why I don't see Machine Games Wolfenstein titles as offensive with how they handle their subject matter, including things like depicting a concentration camp that the player can explore in first person. The game isn't just aesthetically cribbing from the greatest tragedies in history, but also exploring the emotions they created through the player, again, both through gameplay and narrative. This is how the New Order uses its narrative to depict a fight where the outcome always seems hopeless. I think at this point, it's fair to ask, then, what is BJ fighting for? What does he care about so much? The easy answer, or at least an easy way out for the writers responsible for the story, would have been the American dream. BJ is already a strapping Captain America lookalike, why shouldn't he inherit the wide-eyed optimism and Boy Scout outlook on America's history? But the writers at Machine Games don't take the easy way out. Through both games, they take every opportunity to interrogate America's own legacy of oppression. BJ may be an idealist, but he's also empathetic. Another running theme between the two games is BJ reframing his idea of the American dream upon listening to others. One of my favorite scenes from The New Order, BJ sits down with a character named Jay, who's only available during the Wyatt timeline. Through context clues, the player can intuit Jay is really Jimi Hendrix. He discusses with William the abuse he suffered in America before the Nazis took over, being excluded from public spaces, segregated, and treated like less than human. It's a point of fact that things like this happened commonly through America's history. It's a thread expanded upon in The New Colossus, during a talk with Grace, a Black Panther and American resistance fighter. BJ wonders how America fell so easily to the Nazis. It's a clever bit of writing for BJ. Here his good old boy outlook shines through. He thinks everyone in America would have fought as hard as he did against an invasion, knowing what he knows about the Nazis. Grace shatters his reality. Shit. We've been fighting every motherfucking day, Blazkowicz. White America, though? They done packed up and given in. See, I guess they don't have the fighting spirit no more. Nah, they just do whatever the fucking Fuhrer tells them to do. That's baloney. They want to fight the Nazis just as much as we do. All they need is for someone to show them how. You know who's running the South after the Nazis took over? The Ku Klux motherfucking Klan, am I right? That's it. So what you gonna do? You gonna go down there and hold hands with them and build bridges and persuade them to join our cause? Get your head out your ass, Blazkowicz. Forget about the turncoats. Focus on the grassroots. I'm running on empty. Don't know how much time I got. Can't even stand up on my own accord no more. I've seen worse. Maybe you're right. Maybe the American people grew comfortable living under tyranny. Maybe the Nazis will still be running the show after I kick the bucket. Sister Grace always right, brother. I learned that the hard way. I don't know. But I know this. You take freedom away from the American people, you're playing with fire. And I intend to pour some gasoline. It's a moment that echoes how the enemies of each game are still depicted as humans to the player. Persecution, bigotry, and vindication are not abstract concepts like evil. They aren't perpetrated by monsters, but by people. There is no perfect system to fight for because even the old order was flawed. Like scavenging and stealthing through gameplay helps create a sense of tension for the player, so too do these moments help create a sense of tension in the narrative. Even if BJ and his allies emerge victorious, what does the future look like when you're fighting for a dream that never existed to begin with? It's easy to lose faith in the face of any adversity, 
It's a natural human way of processing things, ranging from grief to anger. Like I mentioned in the beginning, faith itself is hard to quantify. It can apply to so many different things. There's no shortage of loss and tragedy across BJ's journey. At every turn, he seems like a character meant to lose hope, to falter and give up. In the new Colossus, BJ is captured and humiliated in a mock trial sentencing him to death. He breaks out of his restraints, kills waves and waves of Nazis, and fights his way out of the chambers. There he finds his mother, just as he remembered her. In his darkest moment, he lays his head on her lap, and she comforts him. And then he wakes up, back in the restraints, confined by his failing body that could never break free even if he wanted. He's led to a grand stadium where he is executed in front of a crowd by Frau Angle. It's a theatrical measure meant to break the spirit of the resistance fighters. At the moment, he has given up. He knows that the fight is lost. As he prepares to die, whatever faith he had that kept him fighting seems gone. But his faith isn't all that matters. It's in those whose his faith touches, and in turn their own lives, that allow BJ to quite literally live on after death in a fitting metaphor for how revolutionaries are remembered. In turn, those same resistance fighters create the larger picture of why BJ keeps fighting, and what he's truly fighting for. BJ Blaskowitz is not a man of God. He has no qualms viciously murdering anyone who gets in his way. He has no issues with drinking, dropping acid, or extramarital sex. It's understandable, given the life-or-death situations he finds himself in, that he's not beholden to religious rules or doctrines. There is little time for religion in the world of Wolfenstein. When every moment might be your last, you tend to live it up a bit. BJ Blaskowitz might not be a man of God, but he is a man of faith. Machine Games does a wonderful job of illuminating why BJ keeps fighting. The very opening of the New Order may as well be a call to action for his hero's journey. BJ sits on an armored bomber, heading to one final suicide run against Death's Head's forces. He's drifted to sleep, his thoughts wandering to a perfect day. It's sunny, kids are running around laughing. A grill sizzles and birds chirp as he pictures a perfect woman at his side. This is the dream he fights for, a perfect American ideal. What makes BJ such an endearing character over the two games is that, despite his patriotic, boy scout, do or die mentality, he has every reason to be cynical and cold hearted. The opening of the new Colossus, as BJ bleeds to death, he flashes back to memories of his childhood where it's revealed he faced abuse at the hands of his bigoted racist father. After he and the player are forced to kill the family dog, BJ's mother holds him close, telling him that there are better days to come. She assures him that it will end better than it began. At this point in the story, the player who finished the New Order already knows the hardships BJ will go through, fighting Death's Head, losing his companions, being tortured, witnessing all forms of evil up close and personal. It's hard to say that anything BJ goes through qualifies as a better day, but that never stops him from fighting for the promise that no matter how bad it gets, something better will come eventually. It goes back to that dictionary definition of faith, to have a firm belief in something for which there is no proof. Many games have issues defining faith or showing it through characters, not in BJ's case. He's certainly no man of God, but he is a man of faith, and that faith sees him through all challenges. BJ's character is illuminated best in an early exposition-heavy scene in The New Order. After battling his way through the sanitarium and escaping with Anya, the head nurse who looked after him for years, he flees to a small farm run by family members of Anya's. Inside, he learns that the year is 1960, Nazis have taken over the planet, an atomic bomb was dropped on America, and that all traces of resistance have been crushed. Without hesitation, BJ goes to the basement and extracts information on where the Nazis hold captured resistance fighters from a captured Nazi soldier. He reasons that if there aren't any free men left to fight the Nazis, then he alone will free them if need be. BJ Blaskowitz has just been told the entire world is on fire. He's the kind of man who asks, where's the fire extinguisher? In the course of gameplay, this is all of course a narrative excuse to keep the game moving along, to prevent the player from getting too bored while also setting up a progression of weapons and gameplay systems that will keep a player engaged between cutscenes. For the character, however, it's a moment that shows his true colors. 
No matter how hard the fight is or how harsh the odds, he doesn't stop until every Nazi is dead. It's been noted that BJ is similar to Doom's Doomslayer, who is driven by a near supernatural hatred for demons, but in BJ's case, it's hatred for Nazis. Whether it's simply innate or inspired by his upbringing, BJ's hatred for Nazis might be what makes him fight, but it's not the reason he keeps fighting. It's how he's called to conflict, but it doesn't inspire him as a character in the face of insurmountable odds, dehumanizing situations and broken dreams to persevere. BJ's hatred alone doesn't give him anything to have faith in. I mentioned at the beginning that faith is hard to quantify. It's something that you believe in, despite having no proof. For BJ, that faith comes from belief that, like his mother said, things will end better than they began. And for BJ, the key to that ending is Anya. Soon after the interrogation on the farm, Anya accompanies him to Berlin where they begin a tryst, sleeping with each other on the train. Soon enough, the two fall in love, and it's that connection that gives BJ his faith, the faith that keeps him going. While most of their romance through the New Order feels like a connection made under pressure, it's the relationship in the New Colossus that feels more cemented. After BJ recovers from his battle at the end of the New Order, he finds out Anya is pregnant with twins. As his body fails him, he thinks back to his childhood. He thinks of memories of his mother hiding a family heirloom wedding ring from his miserly father. His mind wanders. He's bedbound as Anya holds his hand to her stomach to feel the kicking babies. While never stated, I think the implication is that he's associating sensations from his memories with what he's feeling at death's door. He dreams of a nightmare of his father forcing him to kill his own dog. I like to imagine the faint kick of his own children stirs something in his subconscious, reminding him of the shock of the shotgun in his hand as he tries to avoid shooting his family pet. This is where Anya stands for BJ, in between his bloody crusade and his broken past. Throughout the New Order, BJ's internal monologues and musings reveal the internal voice of a poet. BJ's thoughts don't sound like his conversation. On the outside, he's a gruff cowboy. When he's alone with his thoughts, he thinks about life, death, his place in the world, heaven and hell, and the world he will leave to his children. The New Colossus is much the same, but BJ's condition is more severe. After Caroline, his friend and resistance leader, is killed, BJ uses her power armor to continue his fight. His internal voice prays openly, beseeching her to grant him what strength she had left, to watch over him from above to keep him safe. But your suit and the cause is all that keeps me upright. And Anya, her voice, her glory, it buckles me. BJ's faith in a larger power is conjecture, He's never shown praying or opening a Bible, but his mother does pray with him during a flashback. Again, we see the characters past and present intermingling, like his life flashing before his eyes during a prolonged brush with death. More than any other concerns, BJ's overriding worry becomes Anya. When he first wakes up, he brushes aside any concerns for his own recovery and well-being, desperate to find her. If the New Order is inciting incident, that shows that he, all he cares about is killing Nazis no matter the cost around a dinner table, then this is the same for the New Colossus. BJ still plays the American hero, rampaging against the Nazi menace despite the ticking time bomb of his own expiration. When Grace informs him that America hardly put up a fight when the Nazis took over, he takes it in stride. Where she's cynical, he's optimistic. Even at death's door, BJ is invigorated in his fight. In the silent moments between when he's not around anyone else, however, he's haunted. He struggles with telling Anya his fears. He feels that he won't be around to see his children born. Yet he never gives up fighting. Talk to me. Look at me, Anya. I'm the damn tin man. How am I gonna get close to you? I don't care. We'll figure something out. We always do. Huh? Hey, why, why won't you at least try? Because I'm fucking dying. Late in the New Colossus, after BJ's execution and resurrection into a new prototype Nazi body, BJ gets drunk with a crazed redneck resistance leader, Horton Boone, beseeching him to join the resistance cause. Horton is a communist and civil rights activist who was politically active before the Nazis took over. He tells BJ about what he sees as the real rulers of the country, the captains of industry who sent the children of the proletariat off to die. 
Though the two disagree, BJ is willing to put aside those differences for the greater good. In his drunken state, he says that he won't simply give up. He's got two kids on the way, and he doesn't want them living in a world filled with Nazis. After everything he's been through, after all the loss and twists and pain, the New Colossus gives the best look at why BJ fights in these few scenes. These aren't just reasons, they're faith. It's not about a hatred for Nazis. It's about fighting tooth and nail to give his children a better place and a better world than the one he had. Since the very beginning, BJ's battle was irrational, outnumbered, outgunned by an enemy of overwhelming might. Yet time and again, he survives on faith. Not faith in God or a higher power, but as if he's hanging on to his mother's words from childhood. Faith that everything will end better than it began. So he keeps fighting. If the world is taken over by Nazis, he has faith in the prisoners. If America gave up on the Nazis willingly, he has faith there are people willing to fight. If he is old and weak and doomed, he has faith in the love of Anya. And if all else fails, he has the faith in the people by his side. Everyone in the resistance has something or finds something to fight for that gives them faith. Even if that thing is just a chance at a better life. Characters like Carolyn, Fergus, and Wyatt are multifaceted. Each has moments of obvious depression and hopelessness like BJ, but each still persevere. Even after each loss, death, or raid, they regroup and fight again. There's a moment early in the New Order where a British character sacrifices himself to give BJ cover for an assault on the London Nautica. You barely get to know the character. What conversations BJ does have with him make him seem irritable and unlikable. Through clues, you can find he's dying and is giving his life for the cause. It's a sacrifice that kicks off many of the events throughout the games, even if he never lives to see it. As he looks to BJ one last time, he tells him to make it count, believing in his last moments that his death will have meaning beyond him. Because at the end of it all, the Wolfenstein games, for all the atrocities, grim musings on life and death, and apocalyptic violence, are hopeful games. In the moments between the action, players can explore their resistance base, talking to characters and exploring their spaces. The characters have parties, celebrate, live normal lives among each other that they couldn't in the Nazi-inhabited world above. The flow between levels in New Order and New Colossus keeps the player returning to these bases, between combat-heavy sections, and it's a brilliant bit of game design. By keeping the player exploring these areas, discovering the characters inside, and the diverse stories they tell, it helps the player subliminally realize what they, and BJ, is fighting for. Without moments like these, the Machine Game's Wolfenstein titles would be no different than any other linear gung-ho fragfest. The important part of faith isn't in victory, because usually having faith means there is no end to the battle. This is another recurring theme, never stated explicitly between the Machine Game's Wolfenstein titles. Of course, winning the war and ending the Nazi menace is the end goal. But against an enemy so vast, so overwhelming in might and conviction, it's also not realistic. Which is why the Resistance, BJ, Anya, Grace, Carolyn, and the rest aren't pragmatic. They're a diverse, often eccentric, bizarre, and ragtag group, assorted of various ideologies, backgrounds, races, and more. But they're brought together by faith. The same unrealistic, wide-eyed faith that drives BJ, not in a political ideal or religious doctrine, but that they can make the world a better place for tomorrow, if not for themselves, then for the people they love. Wolfenstein's broad take on faith isn't explicit. It's taken all of this reading between the lines for me to even extrapolate how the game sets up a hopeless premise in gameplay and narrative, and how the player echoes the faith of the game's protagonist by overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds. But it's a strong examination on the nature of faith and adversity nonetheless. It's not just a story of perseverance in the face of evil or depression, but perseverance when all seems lost, when the world is against you and there's no help coming, but fighting to the next day and the day after is the only battle plan. There's no room to give up or surrender because that doesn't mean that the Nazis win, but the chance of a better tomorrow is gone. It's grim, but not unrealistic. Removed from the alt-history, pseudoscience, fiction, pulp adventure, these are feelings that are all too common in the world even today. To feel hopeless that any step you take is the wrong one, that every part of your life is designed to break you down, to strip you of dignity and humanity. The feeling that every day is a battle and you won't see the end of the war because the things that trouble us all won't be fixed in our lifetimes. And that's okay. If there's one thing that separates BJ Blaskowitz from most FPS muscle-bound heroes, it's that his depiction shows that even under the strongest, toughest exterior, it's okay to be afraid. BJ is an American ubermensch, a true ideal of a man's man, 
blonde hair, square jaw, leather jacket and all. And yet in his darkest moments, he fears for the future, for his family, for his friends and loved ones. He fears what the world will become, and sometimes he even wants to stop fighting, to give up. But he doesn't. He can't. He wants a better world, even if he isn't around to see it. He still believes it's possible. He has faith, and that's enough of a reason to keep going. Machine games Wolfenstein the New Colossus and the New Order are unlike anything else on the market. What some might see as run-and-gun FPS games with goofy stories and characters have managed to gather a cult audience on the strength of its writing and themes. To me, it makes the games wonderful works of art. They're flawed experiences about deeply flawed people in a hopeless conflict with themselves and the world around them. I think that's something everyone can identify with at some point or another. At the end of the New Order, BJ manages to kill Death's Head, but not without being mortally wounded. Anya and the other Resistance fighters are leading prisoners to safety as he crawls through wreckage. They're waiting for his signal to launch a nuclear warhead into Death's Head compound. Roll credits. While the second game's ending is much more exciting and climactic, what I think truly makes the New Order special is how quiet it is. As the developer credits roll on, an original song by Melissa Hollick plays. It's called I Believe. It's quiet, bittersweet, and contemplative, at direct odds with the adrenaline-pumping gameplay, but not the spirit of the game. Even after two other games in the series, I think it does the best job of distilling the essence of these games, and it speaks for itself. A hero lies bleeding, left for dead. He doesn't know what will happen next. It's a suicide mission where nobody expected to survive, but if he can sacrifice himself, everybody else will make it. He makes a choice to believe that someday it will end better than it began. He holds fast to that faith, and he chooses to let go. You're clear. I believe, I believe, I believe 
Hello everybody and thank you for watching this latest video essay. This one took a while to get out, but I am mostly happy with how it turned out. I am sorry if it is a little bit scatterbrained. Uh, I think my ADHD got the better of me as I was making a lot of these points. Uh, expanded the, the original script from just talking about one game to two games and uh, just took a, a lot of time to, to really play through these games. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed putting it together. If you enjoy video essays like this and my other work, please check out my documentaries. Please like, subscribe, share all you can, and consider giving a little bit to my Patreon. I do this as a side gig. My main job is uh, narrative design, which I do on a daily basis, and I pretty much only make videos on the weekends, um, and I don't have much free time aside from that. So getting paid for these things would be absolutely wonderful because Lord knows I'm not making any ad revenue. With all that having been said, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you all next time.